I mean, I was in a triathlon in Palm Springs. I was in the biking portion of the race. Uh, the cadet was waving me on. He had his back to the traffic. I made the turn and uh, there was a woman going uh, 55 miles an hour in a Bronco that just uh, catapulted me out of my bike and I wound up breaking six vertebrae in my spine. Uh, when you compress the volume of uh, material like this, when you compress that volume, bone fragments go back on the cord. Uh, the neural arch of one of the vertebrae had broken and I had a lot of hmm. cord compression. So they wanted to do a radical surgery. Four opinions from the leading surgeons in Southern California said Harrington rod surgery or nothing. And screwing in stainless steel rods from the base of my neck to the base of my spine was the option to guarantee that I would be able to walk again. Anyway, uh, I decided against the surgery. Uh, and in 1986, that wasn't a common thing that you Why? Um, because when I looked at uh, first of all, I have a background. I know a lot about the spine. So cr creating that kind of mobility, and if it wasn't done properly, or if it was done okay, I could be in pain the rest of my life. I could be uh, uh, struggling with the medications that are, could be possibly addictive. And that when you start with the most radical form of health care, as a first choice, you limit the number of choices you have. Mm -hmm, you start sure. the most conservative <laughs> and you work your way up to the most radical, you always have more choices. So mm. I thought, well, hell, they're telling me I'm never gonna walk again. What's the deal if I do it now or I do it later? Right. So, so I said no to the surgeons and in 1986, it just wasn't something that you did. And I just thought there's an intelligence that lives within us that gives us life. I'm not going anywhere, I'm not doing anything. Let me see if I could connect with it and give it a plan. I mean. First of all, that's a, a really great point because, um, you know, the body has an innate capacity to, he to heal. And if you study a very mechanistic view about the way the body functions, those, those are just models of understanding. But fast forward to information biology or contemporary understanding of biology, it's, it's more vitalistic that there's an energy that the body feeds off of. And so then I was reasoning with the idea I'd been doing martial arts, I had a yoga studio, um, I, did, I, did, I had gotten quite extensive training in hypnosis. Uh, I was interested in this mm. stuff. So I kind of okay. knew that there was an intelligence okay. living within us. Uh, my background as a chiropractor also believes in that innate intelligence. And so I thought, well, that intelligence knows how to heal, but I want to see if I could take it to the next level. Because it wasn't just pain, it was paralysis, mm. it was sensory uh, changes. And I went from very healthy guy to being like face down, not yeah. going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, like here I am, like, you know, that's it. So, so, so I just reasoned that if it wasn't intelligence, then it, uh, I, it, it, I could connect with it. And so... I decided that I was just going to give it a plan and a template, a design, and then when I was clear on that design, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd surrender it to this intelligence because I can't do the healing. It knows how to heal way better than me, but I wanted to take it to that next level. Mm -hmm. Bones heal, but I wanted them to heal better. And it worked. And so sure. six and a half weeks of a dark night of the soul because yeah. I had to train my brain and I knew if I said the design has to be pure, it has to be complete, I have to reconstruct every vertebrae. If I lose my focus yeah. and I start thinking about living in a wheelchair, whoops, that's yeah. the wrong signal. So just by, by intuition, I started working on my presence, my ability to pay attention and stay present. And every time I lost the present moment, I would come back. And I started to notice that when I got frustrated and I did it, it would get, get worse. When I just noticed that it happened and I came back. Non-judgment observation. Yeah, there was just no emotional reaction. There was no charge. And I was able to navigate. I knew that I'd have to first get in the present moment. Yeah. Uh, you know when someone's present with you in your life because they're paying attention. You yeah. know when they're not present with you. They're not yeah. paying attention. So this is an intelligence. i got to be present with it and, and create a very clear design. Uh, so then I would have to, what I knew from my background in hypnosis is I, had, I would have to slow my brain waves down, mm -hmm. get beyond my analytical mind. Now, once I'm in that state, mm -hmm. I would have a clear intention, mm -hmm. a very clear intention and very clear focus. And when I started doing it well, my emotional state started to change. Instead of feeling frustrated, mm -hmm. fearful, impatient, resentful. Mm -hmm. I was feeling joy and freedom and because m I was suppressing those emotional states every time I got present. Because those emotions bring us back to the past. So I had to work over time. And what I didn't know that I was doing the whole entire time was I was improving 
my brain's ability to pay attention and focus. That means I could visualize better. Yeah. But secondly, more importantly, I was able to relax more into the present moment. And by doing that and holding a very clear picture, uh, I started to notice very strong changes in my brain. I, my, I was laying down new circuits. I was creating a new mind and nerve cells that fire together, wire together. If you keep doing it, just like driving a race car, it's going to get easier because mm -hmm. you, you, you become what you practice. Mm -hmm. But you got to pay attention. You got to repeat it. You got to learn. You got to keep experiencing. And, uh, and then it worked. And so then um, I was back on my feet in 10 weeks. And, and then I just said if I was ever able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life uh, studying the mind-body connection and mind over matter. And that's what I've been doing since 1986. So now you have evidence that yeah. common people can do the yeah. uncommon. You don't have to be a monk. You don't have to be a nun. You don't have to be a priest, an academic. The common people are beginning to wrap their minds right. around this and do There's the evidence. Uncommon. This isn't just mystical information. So there it is. Science is that model. And then we have testimony. Like we have people that have healed themselves of stage four cancer. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, over and over again. We have people that have healed themselves that were blind, that were deaf, that had tumors, uh, that had uh, Graves' disease, Hashimoto syndrome, numerous Parkinson's patients, brain injuries. Uh, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, so you know, evidence becomes the loudest voice, right? Yeah. So doctors now are saying, hey, uh, um, you're not really responding to treatment. I, why don't you try this? Now, let me tell you why they're saying that. And that's because if you say, try this, and you see the evidence of people getting better, and the person's not responding to treatment, what else do you have? And right. doctors are now referring, oncologists are referring patients really? right to our office, uh, right to our uh, events, because it's an option for them. So if you're going to change your life, change your personal yeah. reality, you got to change your personality. You got to start changing your thoughts. You got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and say, do I really want to think this? Like, you become the shepherd of your thoughts, yeah. the gardener of your yeah. own mind. You start to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors and say, my goodness, how am I speaking? How am I acting? You start looking at emotions that you live by every day and say, my goodness, I didn't even know it was guilt. It just mm -hmm. feels like me and, or lack. And now the person's becoming conscious of their unconscious part of themselves. And the more conscious we become of the unconscious self, the less unconscious we go during the day. So it begs the question, new thoughts that lead to new choices, new choices that lead to new behaviors, new right. behaviors create new experiences, new experiences produce new emotions. New emotions are the information coming from the environment. They signal new genes and there's evolution. So now we upregulate the gene, you start making a healthy protein. The immune system starts upregulating and all of a sudden it makes new antibodies. Why? Because the body's back in growth and repair and out of survival. So we did, we did a research study for four and a half days. We took um, uh, 35 randomly selected people and we measured 7,500 different gene regulations. And what we want them to do is to think differently, make new choices, do different things, have new experiences and feel new emotions. And we wanted to see in the end of four and a half days if they were able to change their gene expression. And they had eight genes in common. All of them shared the same gene expression of these eight genes. Two genes that suppress cancer growth and tumors. Genes to grow new neurons in your brain. Not just make new connections, but grow new neurons. Mm. Genes that stimulate stem cells to go to damaged tissues that are dying and breaking down and mm. repair them. Genes for oxidative balance, you know, anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke. They all had all the same ones? All, these, these were the eight they had in common, okay. but there were other ones, you know, that were great ones as well. But these eight were the common ones. Uh, and, and, and genes to strengthen the cellular structure and the microtubules of the cell. Now, genes are like Christmas tree lights. They're turning on and off all the time. But if you're doing the same things, feeling the same emotions, thinking the same thoughts, you got the same lights on and the other lights off. And over time, you start signaling the very gene that's on the surface of your genetic propensity. And now you're headed in that direction. So then is it possible then when you change your emotional state Will you change your gene expression? And the answer is absolutely, that you are your own genetic engineer. So now, your thoughts and feelings actually produce an effect in your environment. And when you begin to realize that when you change how you think and feel, you change your state of being, when you change your energy, you'll see a change in your life. Now, you gotta be able to sustain that. You can't have a great meditation or do something inward and then get up in five minutes, go unconscious again. You're taking that 
and you have to bring it into your life and be able to sustain it. So then the person who's responding consciously or unconsciously to the conditions in their life, they don't know they're being a victim to their life. They're saying, oh, I have this health yeah. condition or this is my life until you start figuring it out, until you start knowing. So knowledge then mm. becomes the forerunner to experience. So every time you learn something new, you make lots of connections in your brain, not a little, a lot. An hour of concentration, you'll double, double the number of connections in your brain from, from uh, 1300 to 2600. So then you're laying down philosophical circuits in your brain. The more you think about it, the more you fire and wire those circuits, the repetition of repetition. thinking about it yep. begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain in preparation for an experience. So the more you understand what you're doing yeah. and why you're doing it, then the how gets easier. So I now know after all the research, you give people the right scientific information and yeah. science is the contemporary language of mysticism. And they can turn to the person next to them and explain it, because that's what you'll do. I'll say, now explain that. If you can't explain it, it's not wired in your brain. It means there's something now that's gonna be conjecturous, something you're gonna just have a little superstition about, you know. It, you're not gonna really understand what you're doing and why. But when you can explain it, the model of understanding, yeah. you have the hardware in place. Yeah, you've so now, it. You, you set up the conditions and put people in the experience. <laughs> if they get their behaviors to match their intentions, they're gonna have an experience. Experience then enriches the circuitry, but the end product of the experience is the payoff. And that's the emotion. When you start mm -hmm. to feel unlimited, when you start to feel abundant, when you start to feel free, yeah. now your body's getting the chemical instruction to understand what your mind was understanding. Mm. Now you're embodying the knowledge. Mm. And then you do it again. There you go. And, and then all of a again. sudden you start to master the philosophy. And over time then, you begin to create a state of being. Mm -hmm. That means that you've memorized an internal state. It, it's, it's subconscious, it's a skill, it's a habit. It, and you know that you know how to do it. You don't have to think about it any longer, right? Yeah.